Once again, Mark, podcast show, story time, 1632, chapter 3. Mike used Jenny's car, still dug in the embankment, as a stepping stone to climb into the embankment, onto the embankment, when he planted his foot on a peculiar wall. It immediately gave way, showing him some dirt on the car. He sprawled awkwardly, cursing under his breath, dragged himself to the edge. Once he rose, he gazed down at his tosito between his recent mishap and the effects of throwing himself into the pavement when the shooting started the elegant outfit was looking worn and a little scruffy the rental company is not going to be happy with me he thought ruefully but Mike gave Frank a hand climb out be careful he urged that wall looks solid because it's so shiny but it's nothing but loose earth while Frank while Frank was atop the wall he turned to the others. Mike took the moment to explain his surroundings. His surroundings. He knew his surroundings. What he saw confirmed his suspicions. But I think a ticked off ex tuxedo rental company is probably the least of my problems. A wall wasn't a wall of any kind. It was simply the edge of a plane stretching into the distance. Everything just everything about the landscape was wrong. There's no level stretch that's size anywhere in north and west of Virginia and the sun Frank would cause the fault. Mike, what's happening? Even the damn sun's in the wrong place, he pointed to the south. Should it be over there? Or is that south? wondered Mike. I guess I'd say we one facing north instead of east. Like we should be. He fussed the problem aside. Later there there was more pressing problems to deal with much more pressing. The plane was heavily wooded, not so much so that the mic couldn't see one or two, three farmhouses scattered among, among open fields. One of the farmhouses was not there anymore, it was not more than a hundred yards away, close enough to make, make out details. Jesus! hissed Frank. The two farmhouses in the distance were burning fiercely. One was nearby was not. It was a large rambling structure. Unlike the wooden frame, wooden frame farmhouses which Mike was familiar with, the construction of this one leaned heavily towards stone. How fit is stone, from what Mike could see, if this wasn't for the fact that the farmhouse had all the signs of common property, an unmistakable, ragged, disrespectful air place where people worked. Mike was sworn he was looking at something out of the Middle Ages. He hadn't spent more than two Second study in the farmhouse itself. Farmhouse is still being worked, not but not by farmers. Teeth was clenched. He could sense that faint, that faint standing next to him was filled with the same air. Which Mike looked around. All his mine, all the miners were, all, all the miners were on, were on the plane now, standing in line, staring at the scene. Well, all right, guys, he said softly. I count six of the bastards. Maybe more inside. Three of them are assaulting that poor woman in the yard. And the other three, he looked back at the end of his sight. Don't know exactly what they're doing, but I think they got the guy nailed to his door. They talked for him. Slowly and softly as it was possible, Frank levered around into the crate of his rifle. Despite his contrary with the suit he was wearing, that she was quietly murderous. So what's his what's the plan? He demanded. Mike spoke through tight jaws. I ain't, I'm not actually a cop when you you write down to it, and we've not got any t- any way of, to run me around. Then quite he's looking for handcuffs. Glad to see the rape and torture. So hell, we're reading those guys for their rights. We're just going to kill them. Sounds good to me. So, Darren, I got no problem capital punishment. Never did. Me neither, growled one of the mi- other miners, Tony Abduski, who was a beefy man in his early forties. Like many of the miners in the area, Tony was from the Italian industry. His complexion and features indicated no one whatsoever. Tony, like Mike, was holding a pistol. He reached up with his left hand and quickly removed his tie. Angrily, he thrust it into his pocket. The rest of the miners did likewise of their own. None of them t- none of them took off their jackets, however. All of them were wearing white sh- shirts, and all of them 
were experienced hunters. They had suit jackets, grey and brown, and neither blue. A better camouflage. After removing the ties, a bow tie, in Mike's case, the miners simply loosened up the top collar's buttons. For the first time in their lives, they would hunt in a Sunday best, wearing dress shoes instead of boots. Mike led the way, working toward the farmhouse through the small grove of trees, birch trees, a, f- a part of whom I noted idly. That's odd, too. Most of mine was simply wishing that the centipedes provided more concealment. Fortunately, the criminals at the farmhouse were too preoccupied with their crimes, paying any attention to the area around them. The miners got within 30 yards of the house without even being spotted. They were now squatting down, hidden in the trees at the very edge of the farmyard. The woman being raped was not more than 40 yard, feet away. Mike's eyes shied away from the sight, but his ears still registered moans. The coarse laughs of the moan assaulted her. One of them, men holding his arms to the, her arms to the ground, barked a dewy mark at the men on top of her. The rapist grunted some more, some sort of reply. Mike didn't understand a word, but they sounded German. He'd been stationed in Germany in a, in a year, every year. He'd been in the army. But he remembered a little, a little of the language below the, the central phrase, et bear bitter. The, the, um, this, these guys are foreigners, murmured Bell. The young man's face was tight regular. What do they think they do? Come over here and I, and Mike took a short, made a short cut gesture, commanding silence. He went back to studying the criminals. All of them wore some peculiar armour and those weird helmets. Although men, the men, sorted women, had removed theirs, the discarded gear was lying on the ground and ran away by, and torching the women farmers still had their armour and helmets on. So they had stacked their firearms against the wall of the far, farmhouse. For a distance, the rifles looked like some kind of weapons carried by two men killed by the f- police chief. Helmets on were riding by he had seen an old Spanish cost- cordonadores, helmets of metal, pots, bracelets, with fangs flavouring in the points towards the front and back. The armour, if you remembered right, was called a carissa, steel brace, breast and back plate tied on with leather stripes. Strips. Outside of the antique looking firearms, the only weapons they had in their possession were swords. Swords? He looked back at the three men insulting the women. They were not wearing swords. But then, now, but now that Mike knew what to look for, he spotted the weapons immediately. A scabbard bays had been unbuckled and tossed into the ground near the firearms. Mike had never once in his life considered a practical merchant. The cat's right, but he could understand why a sword would be awkward. These men, he was suddenly quite certain, were not committing this crime for the first time. They were lax and practised casualists. About the activity, they, you're dead men. I thought it was grim, final. He turned his head and whispered it to, in Frank's ear. You got, you got the right, only, you got the only rifle. Can you take your out the bastards at the door? Don't forget, you're, they're wearing armour. Don't go for a body shot. Mike and Frank stared at the three men, torching the farmer. The heavy door of the house had been opened wide and pressed against the wall. A farmer's wrists were pinned to the door with knives. A man in front of them was digging another knife into the farmer's thigh while his two companions shouted at him. That, that means Mike thought this is some kind of interrogation. It seems a pointless exercise. The farmer screamed with pain, oblivious to any questions. Forty yards, Mike Frank shouted. Don't worry about it. Thirty yards of scrub, slug in the ass would take anyone down. Mike nodded. He turned to the other one. He motioned to hold Harry. Left it. Harry crept up to him. Mike scowled at the sawn off double bottle shotgun in Mike's hand. Forget that stupid thing. We got to get. We got to get. We got innocent people mixed in these thing, with these thugs. He handed Mike the right gun. Then he had taken from the Cherokee. Use this. He's loaded the bucks up. The magazine's full. Or he jet. Then Frank. When Frank, Frank shoots those guys at the door, you back him up. He's only going to be aiming at their legs on account of the armour. You finish him off after they're down. Mike nodded. He tucked the sword off the trunk drum. 
I'm in the nearby shop. I'm sort of right shop to go. After passing over the additional shotgun shells in his pocket, Mark glanced over to the rest of the men, all of them like themselves, themselves armed with nothing more than pistols and revolvers. He decided that there was no point in developing any more of a battle plan. Besides, I can't bear listening to this any longer. Just back me up, guys, he whispered to Frank. Don't start shooting till I do. A second later, Mike rose to his feet and strode out of the trees toward rapists. He held a revolver in his fur right hand. His steps were quick, but he, but he was not running. Mike hadn't boxed professionally in years, but all the other training experience took over. Suddenly, steady, don't lose your call. It's just another fight, a strange whimsical part of his mind. Told him how foolish he looked, marching towards mayhem, the wing tops, and the butt to but he ignored it. First man spotted him and was the one squatting on his heels, and was three feet from the woman. The man had been simply watching the scene, leering. When Mike's movement caught his eye, the man turned his head. His eyes widened. He not known, been, he was not more than thirty feet away. Turned sideways. Mike stopped. He crouched slightly in a firing range stance, bringing out the revolver. Some kind of some part of mind noted the instant reflexes of the man going to kill him was impressed. He's no tight over him. He, the man was already rising, shouting and warning. Both men, hands firmly gripped, caught the hammer, steady, steady, centre of mass, squeezed the... As, as always, the magnum went off with a roar and butt in Frank's hand. He watched just long enough to see the slug had slammed into the man, turned his shoulder and knocked him flat. But it's second no more. The man must do what he liked and it's clearly out of action. Mike could hear the faint crack of the Franks Winchester and Harry shouting. He ignored the sounds, blocking them out as easy as he had blocked out the roar of the crowd while he was in the ring. He is swiveling now, ready to take out the man holding the woman's arms. The one that was facing him squarely. Mike could, not, could see the man's mouth gaping open. But his face was a blur. The man was still on his knees, but he had released the woman's arms and was rearing back on his heels. Just another fight. Cut the hermit. Single shot, more accurate. Send a mass. Again, the 32 three fights and roared. The shot took the man square in the chest, slamming him back as he had been run over by a truck. Mike knew he was, he was dead before he hit the ground. One left, he tangled up. And up, he had tangled up his top trousers. Rapist was shouting something again. Mike didn't understand the words. Nothing registered except fear. The man was scrambling off the woman. He tried to rise, tripped, tripped, tripped on his trousers, crawled on his face. It was clear, but he was now clear of the woman. Mike raised the revolver, ready to kill him, but stopped when he saw Dr. Nichols was already there. There's something so surprised about the way Nichols, from close range, leaned over and shot the man in the back of the head once, twice. So much of, for that, Mike turned away, looking for the farmhouse. He could remember now hearing several shots of Frank's rifle. All three men at the doorway spent lying on the ground. One of them was not moving. He, he was on knees, sprawled against the wall in the great farmhouse. His buttocks were covered in blood. Mike was certain... He was the first one Frank had shot. First of all, for that he teased Frank about the silly Dan Lever action. Frank was both an excellent marksman, one most reliable man Mike could ever met. Got his deer every season, usually on the first day. Frank could shoot for the lowest by just below the crevices. Pariah for sure. Probably dead or dying. The other two were ripping in the grind. Screaming, clutching their legs. He didn't scream uh, with a long. Harry had, was already there, wrapped, raging forward. The young miner stopped abruptly a few feet away, pumped shell into the chamber, aimed a shotgun and fired. For all that, Harry was uh, obviously in a rage. He didn't lose his composure, aimed for the neck, unprotected by the other, uh, either helmet or armour, and the man was almost decapitated. But shot sent his helmet bouncing off the farmyard wall, a stretch broken, furling about. 
Harry Silver pump level fire. The other man was silent and moving, dead. Blood and brains everywhere. Another helmet went flying, straps flip, flapping. For good measure, there would be no mercy here. Harry pumped another round, skip, stepped forward, and shot a paralysed man, sprawled against the farm hole's wall. The range was not only more than three feet. This time the helmet stayed on, but because the man's head was removed only because the man's head was removed entirely, blood gashed out a severe mech, painting the rough sea stones of gore. Mike caught a glimpse of the motion somewhere in the darkness within the farmhouse. He ducked. Harry, down! Fire in the hole! Mike probably saved Harry's life. A young miner was lung- lunging around when the gun in the farmhouse went off. The bullet took him in the... S- in the side and knocked him down, yelping. On the ground, Levick grabbed his rib, still yelping. But it's more surprised and outraged in sound than anything else. Mike was pretty sure the wound was superficial. Trust me, Frank, he yelled. Cover me, Frank, he yelled. Racing to the do- side of the door, he heard Frank's Winchester fire again. He, he, didn't, he couldn't see the shots themselves, but he knew Frank would be... Firing through the door, firing, driving back whatever was inside. A corner of his eye saw James Nichols and Tony Abadi leaving the pistols and firing shots into the small windows along side the farmhouse. He could hear the wooden shutters splittering. Once he reached the door, Mike pressed against the farmhouse. He was on the other side of the door from the farmer. The man was so conscious now, soaked with blood and sagging. His weight, he was a middle-aged man, heavy in the gut. He was, he was wearing his wrists badly, te- tearing his wrists badly. Blood spurted ever. Jesus, he bleeded to death. Mike's decision was instant. He sprang across the doorway to the farmer's side, momentarily exposing himself to fire from the farmhouse. But there was no gunshot. Two quick, powerful jerks within the lights. As gently as he could, Mike lowered the man to the ground. They, that was all we could do for him at the moment. Mike has stayed in for the second time. Second not, the interior of the farmhouse was poorly lit. It's possible to see anything inside. Caution and his, and his army training urged him to wait until his companions could come up in support. On the other hand, all these guns were... Are, all these guns are those weird antiques, single shot musket loaders. I bet the son of bitches ain't had time to re reload. Again, the decision was sharp, immediate. Mike drove through the door, landing and landed rolling. Good decision, bad luck. His enemies had not had time to reload. Unfortunately, Mike rolled in, right into him. For, the, for a moment, everything was chaos. Mike felt a body landing on top of him. Prized as much as a collision, had jarred the pistol out of his hand, frantic now. He lunged to his feet, hurling the man off his back. Tried at, tried at least, the man, however, whoever he was, clutched Mike like a restless. Mike snarled and slammed his elbow back. Darn it, he'd forgotten the serious. His left elbow was aching from the impact. At least he knocked the man. At least he knocked the man loose. Mike had never been in a gun battle before his life. He had a boxer's training and instincts, if not gunfighters. Didn't think to look for his pistol. Just pivoted and drove a right cross at his enemy's chin. Eight pro fights. The first seven were won by knockouts. None, none, none of them later in the first round. Mick had quit the game because he realised he didn't quite have a re- the reflexes. But nobody uh, had, ever, uh, had ever said he didn't have the punch. Folk, whoever, whoever he was, sailed across the room and slammed against a heavy table. His jaw hung loose, broken. His head lobbed, lobbed to the side. That day's helpless brought no mercy. Neither that, nor the fact that the man was quite a bit smaller than Mike. It was not a fight governed by Marquis of Queensbury rules. Mike bounced forward to his toes and slammed another hand right 
It's the man's over him below the Sigurius. Another, if it had been a referee, Mike would have had been disqualified by either, either punch. His next punch was a left hook which shattered the man's jaw and left him right off his feet. Mike was a very strong man, and like most, he was he knew how to fight. Blows were like slave hammers. Mike started to slam another right to Flo's face, but managed to stop the punch. Christ, Stearns, enough, he's done. Forced himself to step back. If being driven by the invisible referee, the trained reaction brought some clarity to his faults. Mike had struck to realise how much fear and rage had, had possession of him. He felt like, like a vile of pure adrenaline. The opponent collapsed to the floor in a heap. Mike dropped his hand, arms and let his fists open. His hands hurt. He had forgotten how much punishment Ben Neville fighting inflicted on the victor as well as the vanquished. He was surely he was starting to tremble now from delayed reactions of the fight. Club and pain was affecting him more than anything else. For all he'd been been something of a roughneck in the youth. Might have never killed him before. Hand fell on his shoulder, turning him around. He saw Dr. Nichols' concerned face. Are you all right? Mike nodded, nodded. He'd even managed to weigh in a little smile, held his hands, three of his knuckles were split and bleeding. As far as I know, dog, this is all that went wrong with me. Nichols took the hands and examined them, kneading the joints. Don't, don't think anything's broken, he murmured. The doctor took a quick glance at the unconscious thug on the dirt floor of the, dirt, dirt floor of the farmhouse. As hard as you punch. You young fella, I don't I really suggest you use wet gloves from now on. The bastard took looks like someone took an axe hand to him. For a moment Mike felt a little light headed. He could sense a farmer minor, other miners miners raging through the farmhouse looking for more enemies. But he weren't any. Blood rushing through his ears blurred the words they were all speaking, but Mike could sense from the tone that they were let all dangerous bars. He took the deep, almost shuddering breath. Then, with a good shake of the head, he cleared away his sensation of business. Nick released his hands. Thank you. So, and he said softly, he said softly, Nicholas' face broke into a sudden smile. Please call me James. I believe we've been properly introduced. The doctor turned away. And now I've got some barely injured people to deal with. I think I'm a I'm a tattered hypocrite oaf. Enough to, to one day. In matter, in a matter. Christ, Nicholas, first do that, not harm. Guilty might remember my Harry Ellis and the farmer and the woman. He assumed he was his wife. He stopped the way after N- N- Nichols ready to st- lend assistance. Then stopped and turned, looking for Frank. Jackson was standing by a large fireplace, slowly examining the, uh, the interior of the room. Most of the farmhouse it seemed to consist of a small chamber, single chamber, though Mike could not see a single staircase, like a ladder leading to the upper story. Very little light filtered in the farmhouse, since the three windows were shiny, but Mike could see the place was a complete shambles. Fags had obviously been looting along with the other crime. Now they'd been thoroughly through the foul mess and been ransacked. Mike is sure realised that the farmer had been tortured in order to view whatever hidden treasures he might possess. Not much for the not much for the looks of this place. After all, it's flown for its size and painstaking construction. Houses were poorer looking than any farm I could have ever been. There'd been no interior lighting, no plumbing f- f- from what she could tell, no glass in the windows. Even the floor was simply packed earth. Frank's eyes met him. I'll see this. I, I, I'll see this. Mike, Mike, Tony already coming to check us out. You go to help the doctor. That's so Mike found Nickers working on the farm. 
The doctor had apparently gone through all the ranges in the first aid kit and moved his jacket, returning his search to trips. He was now bare from the waist up, so all that Nichols was of late mid, middle age. There was almost no fat to his wildly masculine. A high end hardback flesh covered with a thin film of sweat gleamed in the sunlight. Mike looked around. D- Daryl was tending to the Harry leaflets. L- leverets. Leverets also had a shirt off and was googling at the wound in his side. It was quite spectacular. His entire thigh and hip was soaked with blood. Along with his rip, Mike didn't think it was anything really serious. The wound was already bound with a bandage roll. The bandage was blood soaked and Mike thought Bleeding stopped. Just a flesh wound, he told Nicholas. Say, Mike turned. The doctor had cocked his head towards him. I treated Harry first thing. You've been amazing. He has a truly amazing scar to drag about to his grandkids about. That body must travel a long one before passing out. No eternal meaning, no, no, far as I can tell. Nicholas had head, head jerked towards the woman. She had rolled into her, over to her side, her hands and covering her face. Her knees were drawn by the chest in a fetal position. She was sobbing quietly and steadily. Her shabby dress had been pulled down over her legs. Her two jackets were covering her further. Minus and had contributed to this jacket. Don Richards, Don Richards and Larry Masita were squatting nearby. The expressions of confusion and distress beyond what they'd done. They obviously had no idea what other help they would give her. She'll be all right, murmured Nichols. His face tightened as much as any gang rambled anyway. He looked down at the farmer, but this guy may not have, may not have it. There's no artery, major artery, so. But he's lost an enormous amount of blood. Mike squatted by the, by the doctor. How can I help him, James? He saw Nicholas and bound up to the farmer's, but well, up to the farmer's wounds. Bound it all to the farmer's but the blood was always soaking through the cloth. The doctor was bandaging, tearing many strips from his ruined shirt, ready to add new bandages. Give me your tuxedo jacket for starters. See if there's any blankets inside. Anything to keep him warm. He's in shock. Mike took off his jacket and handed it to the doctor. He spread it all over the thought room. And then Nicholas put out his cheeks. Give me an ambulance so we can get, take this guy, poor guy to that hospital. Sort, sort that out. I know I can't. I can, I can not, I've done what I can for medical supplies and facilities. The doctor raised his hand and slowly studied the surroundings. Area, but somehow I've got a bad feeling that any emphasis in the hospitals are going to be hard to come by. He, his eyes met Mike. What the hell are we anyway? He met and smiled. Don't tell me that, didn't, don't tell me this is what Richard in would be like. I don't think pushing me to move him. Him. So in fact, again, his eyes cra- ranged about. Not even the movie delivers. That's crazy. It was only somewhere that was only somewhere that was. If I remember right, we're only an hour and a half from Petersburg. Copy, Mike copied the doctor's explanation of the surroundings and said softly. I don't think we're in as a rest of dinner anymore, too. Mike copied the, do- do- copied the doctor's examination of the surrounding area. Softly, I don't think we're in the rest of dinner anymore, Toto. Nicholas chuckled. Anything, nothing's right, James. Not the landscape, not the trees, not the people, not. He jerked his thumb over his shoulder, pointing at the farmer, which 
doing behind him. There's nothing like this in West Virginia, I tell you that. For the poverty of this place, the farmhouse itself is so wicked, it's just, it's just no wicked shack. Anything that big with world built and old to be, be a bit taught in. Been declared a historical monument 15, 15 years ago. He leaned over and seized one of the folks' guns, still leaning against the farmers. After a quick scrutiny, he held it out for Snickles. You see anything like this? The doc told his head, shook his head. Neither have I, amused Mike. Ken Hobbs uh, says it's a match lock. You know. You can see, you never seen anything like this, Dot shook his hand. Never have I, at your moves. Ken Hobbs says it's a match lock. You know, you know too, he's made a hobby of antique weapons as his, his whole life. They hadn't made guns like this in, oh, maybe 200 years at least. Even at the time, even at the time of the American Revolution, everyone was using flint locks. He looked, he eyed the weapons that bore respectfully. Look at the, this thing, it will you? Must be at least 70.75 calibre. He st- started over, started over the, Something else. I was interrupted by Frank coming at the door. Oh, clear, he said, and Jackson seemed as if it was ever. Some of it was simply his personality. Some of that was his, due to the fact the Union Secretary Treasurer was the only one of them besides Nicholas who had any real combat experience. Mike examined the other man he could see. All of them were sitting Nick, Jackson Nichols. Now the, the fight was over, was starting to react. Deffert was lying on his back, clutching the bandages of his side and he- skirting the sky. The young miner, being so modestly ruthless in the heat of the action, looked like he, like he a stunned bear. bear. He's st- st- like a stunned steer. His eyes were wide, empty of all thought. Mewing next to him, Darren's head was slumped against his shoulders. He's grabbing his knee so tight that his knuckles were white. Off to the side, near the rank victim, Dot Richards, Don Richards and Larry Mitchell were no longer squatting alertly with their guns into the iron. Both men were now sitting fat, their legs torn. No longer squat. Making so many other men could see all of them except Jackson Nichols. No, the fight was over. We were starting to react. Leaf is a trying, lying his back, clutching a bang to his side, staring at the sky. The young miner had been so murderously ruthless at that in the moment, but like a stunned steer. His eyes were wide, empty of all fault. Kneeling next to him, Darren's head was slumped between his shoulders. He was gripping his knees so tightly, his knuckles were white. Off to the side, near the rank victim, Don Richards and Larry Sensor were no longer squatting overtly with their hands in the guns in their hands. Both of them were now sitting flat, the legs pulled out what front, supporting themselves with their other hands. The weapon was laying on, on the ground, both men are breathing heavily. Richard was cursing softly, which a devout Catholic was muttering the Lord's Prayer. Mike drew his, out his third breath against it, um, blew out his breath almost like a whistle. I think you must. Most of us are in here are a bit, in a bit of shock, James. Except for you and Frank. The doctor barks a little laugh. Don't kid yourself. Someone's got, thought I'll wake up in a panic. So, so do I. I'm right, so I will imagine. Jackson, leaning against the thought, door post, shook his head. Not tonight, not tomorrow night, sure enough. The day after that, we will be real bad. I'll get the shakes. Such a shooting. We survived it, it screamed grim, grimly. Christ, that was the first firefight that anyone I saw, saw in there. I think I saw a name. He shot himself off the doorstep. Not least, we did something almost a firing. He stared down at Mike, who was still crossing next to the door. And then, how are you? He demanded. Before the reply could come, they didn't give any shit. Mick. You got. You're not that tough. Mick chucked her mercy. 
But I thought I wasn't, I wasn't about to kind of claim it. Tough, true. I wish I, f- I feel like a truck hit me. Still trying to imagine, figure out how uh, uh, come I'm still alive. The fresh issue is himself marching towards the farmyard like a mosquito machine. Cold as ice, bing, bang, bang, just like that. One man, one dead one, he took, looked over his body of the first man who was shot. Surely he didn't need to be a doctor to know that man was dead, dead, dead. The magnet well, must have blown right through the, his heart. Well, that, well, that, why not? We brought, brought the monster into the first place. Stopping power. They call it Jesus. He turned his, pierced his lips, deciding to decide, trying to decide exactly how to, fit, how he felt, faint, cut through the, the fog. How Pete cut through the fog. Faint, cut through the fog. Don't. His friend said, "You know, you won't make any sense of it today, Mike. Trust me, I'll let it. I'll let it go for time." Truth echoed. Nichols, the doctor, rose to his feet, and motion reminded Mike that he was supposed to look for blankets. Sorry, he muttered. Mike, Mike got up, started towards the front, fine hostel. Frank, did you notice any blankets while you were? Suddenly, a shout came from above. Tony in his voice, but I looked up. Tony was leaning out of a small upper window, pointing his finger. We got trouble, he exclaimed. Mike followed the pointing finger. A small dirt road leading over to the farmyard, bending towards a grove tree. From the ground, Mike couldn't see anything that passed the trees. Pant of the way, he seen them over over there. It's a hell, Mike. I swear it's true. That stagecoach coming his way, it's got by four horsemen. What's more than a quarter mile away? We don't... We be here any second. Voice rose with excitement. With all those other twenty, with about twenty men pounding after them on foot, some of them were carrying goddamn huge spears. I kid you not, spears for Christ's sake. Leaning over the window still, Tony glanced at the dead fellows lying in the farmyard. Just look at those bastards. Not do they do not want to do the ones riding the horses. For the matter. Mike started seeing the direction. Tony had pointed. The dirt road was more than in nature of the cart path. Two furrows worn into the earth, packed earth, the trees blocking its sight of the area below were twenty yards away, and Mike did not did, could hear the sound of pounding hooves. Second later, three four horsemen came into the view across the street round the trees, and these four men. These men were already also wearing helmets of castillas with sword scalpers to the wrist. Mike could see that they looked very looked like a very pistol slug on our shoulders. Four horsemen sp- spotted him and shouted something. All four riders drew up the reins, bringing in their mounts to the absolute halt. A moment later they were fat, followed around by the bend by a truck drawn by a team of six horses. The bend driver frankly Sword on the ribs, briefly between the vehicle to to, uh, to halt before it rammed into the stationary outriders. As it was, the deep vehicles soon sideways crossed the road. One of the vi- vi- wheels caught fire, almost tipping over the hump, over thing. Tony called it a stagecoach, but it was not like any stagecoach movie scene, not even a movie. The vehicle. For his eloquent woodwork and the weight trappings reminded him of a small covered railway gun. Again, the lead work horseman shouted something as before the voice was foreign, but Mike was now certain the language was German. At least his memory wasn't playing tricks with him. A moment's silence followed as the horseman stared at the Americans. Two farmers by the women had raised their feet. And were holding their guns half raised, so Daryl, so were Frank and Tony Nichols rose a half squat. Please forward out. Oh. 
spot, he fills and spotted him and shouted something. All four boys drew up the reins, joined the moment so short and halt. A moment later, they were followed round the bend by a vehicle drawn by a team of six horses. The driver frankly stood sword on the reins, burying Bernie bringing the vehicle to the halt before it rammed into the stationary outriders. As it was, the vehicle slewed sideways across the road. Some of the wheels caught a furrow, almost tipping over the over. Tony had called it a stagecoat, but not, no stagecoats might have been seen. Not like in the movies, the vehicle was its from its all from all for all his elegant woodwork and over trappings reminded him more than a small covered wagon. That again, the lead horseman shouted something. As before, the words were foreign, but Mike was not almost certain the language was German. At least his memory wasn't playing tricks on him. Moments later, silence followed as the horseman stared at the Americans. Two miners were by the women, raised their feet and were holding their guns up afraid. So was Darrell, and so were Frank. <coughs> Tony rose to the horse, what the soldier pistol, police pistol, held Lucy by the easy hands. Even Hank still sprawled on the ground, on the ground, clutching the bandage, and his wrist was groping for a right gun. The last miner, Chuck Wills, was in the farmhouse. Police said Lucy and when even Hank felt spoiled on the ground, clutching the manager of his ribs, was groping the right gun. The last miner, Charles Chuck Horse, was in the farmhouse. Mike heard him whistle, whisper for the door. I've got them covered, Mike. Let's, uh, just say the word. Mike held out his hands. Hold everything. Let's not start shooting without calls. Could see the four horsemen reaching slowly for the pistols slung on their saddles. Mike remembered uneasily and blatantly that his own weapon was lying somewhere on the floor of the farmhouse. The truth, the curtain on the side of the coach was drawn aside. That moment, the curtain on the, on the side of the curtain was drawn aside. A face popped through, staring at Mike. The face was that of a young woman, looking very distraught. A few strands of long black hair escaped the cap over her head. Her eyes were blown and her compaction was dark as she was banished. She was also, might suddenly, sm- suddenly smile, suddenly smile, cheerful as it could be, strangely, so perhaps, but then again, perhaps not. It, the instincts are still, still will work sometimes, but after all, when logic and reason were fled. Ease up, guys. I think we've got a damsel in distress here. The way I see it, that make, works out, that make, make, makes figuring out how the side, which sides were on a piece of cake. Frank chuckled. You always uh, were a man, you damn fool for a pretty face. Mike shrugged, still smiling. He was moved slow, moving slowly towards the carriage. He kept his hands widespread so the outriders could see he was unarmed. You call that face pretty? He demanded on his shoulder. You're not Franks. I think you've, we just got promoted. We were at the set of the movie Deliverance with a snort. Maybe it was Texas Chainsaw now. Texas Chainsaw Massacre now. Woman's face was closer. Now we're in Cleopatra, Mike said. Words came out more softly than intended and realised with a little st- start of surprise that he was no longer joking at all.